Professor. Today we are very pleased to present ECPN's ninth webinar, Pathways into Conservation Science. ECPN is happy to have three conservation scientists speak with us today, Dr. Tom Lerner, Dr. Gregory Dale Smith, and Dr. Robin Hodgkins. Before we continue, I would like to familiarize you with GoToWebinar, the program we are using to facilitate this webinar. The view window where you see our title slide right now can be resized by clicking and dragging the lower right corner. The control panel is where you as an attendee can take some control of your screen. You may find that with inactivity, the control panel automatically minimizes. If you would like to keep it open during the entire presentation, under the tab View, there is an, audio, an auto hide and control panel option that can be turned off by unselecting it. All of you listening out there are muted. Now I'd like to take a moment before we begin to share some information about ECPN. ECPN is a network within AIC that is dedicated to supporting conservation professionals as they move through the first stages of their careers. We do this by organizing a variety of initiatives and programs. Please visit ECPN's page on AIC's website where you will find numerous resources for emerging conservators including links to previous blog posts and webinars as well as a link to our Facebook page where an active community of emerging conservators post questions and advice and offer support. We encourage conservators of all levels to join in on the conversation. You can also follow ECPN's activities on AIC's blog, Conservators Converse. Recent posts offer insight into achieving AIC's professional associate status and getting involved with the FAIC Oral History Project. ECPN has been busy developing our wiki page within the AIC Wiki Education and Training section. Here you'll find numerous resources that have been created over the years. To stay informed about ECPN's activities, consider subscribing to our periodic e-blasts, which you can do by logging onto the AIC website, clicking on Manager Profile, and selecting ECPN. Through our popular webinar series, ECPN strives to provide ongoing programming that responds to the needs of emerging professionals at different stages of their early careers although we believe that the webinar series can be beneficial to all conservators. Recordings of our webinars may be accessed on AIC's YouTube channel. A recording of today's program will be posted there soon. During today's program, the invited speakers will touch on the history of education and training in conservation science and the current pathways into the field. ECPN hopes that the webinar will provide guidance to individuals considering careers in conservation science, current students and postdoctorate fellows entering the field, as well as inform emerging conservators. The format of this webinar is Q&A style. I will be asking our speakers questions that we have received from our audience. If there are questions that we do not answer, we may be able to address them later in a blog post. To begin the program, each of our speakers will briefly describe their own education and training experience. So Tom Lerner, would you like to begin? Sure. Thanks, Elise. Um, and I will try and keep this very brief because it's can easily end up in a, as a very long story, um, but I um, read chemistry um, as a bachelor's degree uh, back in England, um, and it was a, a four-year course. Um, I then um, ended up going straight into the um, conservation of easel paintings course of the Courtauld, um, and there's probably not time right now to explain how that jump happened, but it was, it was quite um, a complicated one and not an obvious one at all. But I then ended up um, doing the three-year diploma at the Courtauld um, Institute on Paintings Conservation, and I was um, very in intent on becoming a practicing conservator. But with my science background, the, the conservation science as aspect was always a very strong um, part of my training. Um, I then took an internship at the National Gallery of Art in DC, where, in fact, all three of the panelists today have actually been through or are currently at. Um, but I had this amazing um, opportunity to do a, um, a, a split internship, half in paintings conservation, half in scientific research. Um, at the end of that, I, um, um, I moved to the Tate uh, in London. Initially, it was a, a four-year fellowship, um, amazing actually, four-year fellowship, 
set up between the Tate and Birkbeck College, uh, part of the University of London, to do a, a, a PhD in analytical chemistry. Um, so I got my PhD that way um, at the Tate and then uh, re remained at the Tate um, off, off, after then. Great, so should I pick up from there, Tom? <laughs> Please do, Greg. Yeah. Your experience? So uh, out of high school, my interest, or at least at the time, I thought my interest was in nuclear engineering. So I went to uh, a small school in Kentucky, Center College, with the expectation of doing uh, a 2 3 engineering program. Um, but being a small private liberal arts school, I took general education requirements courses. In my freshman year, I ended up in a anthropology, cultural anthropology course. And from that point on, I, I never looked back. I loved it and ended up doing a double major in chemistry and archaeology and pursued those kind of independently. But for graduate school, I chose to go to a program at Duke University because they had a lot of interdisciplinary programs. And I knew that they had two excavations going on in the Galilee region of Israel. So. Um, I was lucky enough to find a, a PhD research group in physical analytical chemistry that would allow me to more or less spend the nine months of the academic year doing my PhD research in a very mainstream topic of chemistry, but then spend my summers uh, working as a, uh, a field chemist and area supervisor for those excavations. So at that point, I started realizing that I could perhaps marry the two interests in science and culture into a career. I wrapped up my PhD and got a Marshall Fellowship to go to University College London, where I worked with Robin Clark in Raman Microscopy of Pigments. And uh, most of that work was done at the British Library and at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, from there, I ended up at a synchrotron facility out on Long Island doing uh, infrared microscopy on the beam line, um, then got back into cultural heritage, uh, transitioning from ancient things to the most modern artist materials, working as part of the uh, modern paints project that Tom uh, was also a part of when he was at Tate, and in collaboration with the Getty as well. Um, from there, I ended up with my first kind of real job uh, as a professor, an Andrew W. Mellon professor of conservation science at the graduate training program at Buffalo. And after five years, the opportunity at the Indianapolis Museum of Art became available. And so I came here to set up their first science lab and to outfit and operate that. Robin? So I started off with a, a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry with an Art and Art History minor um, at a small liberal arts college. And uh, while I was there, found out about conservation as a way to marry chemistry and art um, together, and was able to get a taste of conservation science through a summer uh, research program in the chemistry department that ended up letting me work with a private conservator. Um, and from there, I decided, though, to go straight for organic chemistry for grads and thinking beyond what type of uh, job options I might want in the future. And um, in the end, decided to go with UCLA. Um, and the same year I started, the UCLA Getty Conservation Program was starting up. And I ended up connecting with uh, the professors in that program, which um, kind of guided my research. And I found a uh, chemistry professor that would let me do research related to conservation. Um, and because of that, I was able to connect with the Getty Conservation Institute and meet the scientists there. And, um, and we can talk more about that later. But um, I also then was able to do a small internship with uh, Bronwyn Ormsby at Tate. Um, and after graduating from UCLA, I moved over to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a one-year fellowship, and then jumped down to DC, um, working with the, at the Smithsonian, um, specifically at the National Museum of the American Indian, joint with the Museum Conservation Institute. Um, and then now I'm currently um, on a three-year fellowship at National Gallery of Art. Great. 
So how does the role of a conservation scientist differ from that of a conservator, and how is the training different? Well, should I just jump in on this one, um, Elise? Um, I, I suspect most of the audience understands the difference between a conservation scientist and a conservator. Um, obviously, conservators do the hands-on work, and typically the scientists figure out research and provide sort of analytical um, aspect to the to the work, but I I guess this question is getting at a little bit that there are indeed um, you know many conservators who also have a strong interest in technical study, and it's I think becoming more and more common to see conservators take on more of that um, technical role. Um, the obvious ones would be some basic microscopy and cross sections, and maybe even some XRF. Um, and um, but but really, so I, I, I guess that that um, the distinction is becoming um, far less uh, you know clear. Um, the the, tra the training is um, how the training is different is is actually quite in uh, interesting and difficult question to answer because the training for a conservator is fairly established and everybody will know the various routes um, and probably will be aware of different ways this happens in different countries. Um, you know, the sort of typical types of training would be um, doing, as, as I did, three years on a, on a single discipline, paintings, conservation at the Courtauld, whereas in the US it's far more common, I think, if, if not in all the programs, to do a much more general training of many, many different types of artwork and, and disciplines in the first year, and the specialty comes um, a bit later. Um, but the, the training of a conservation scientist, I guess is the key of this discussion today, and what's interesting about it is that there really isn't an established pathway into the profession we're calling conservation science, and um, even though that has obvious frustrations and difficulties for people trying to plan a way into the profession, um, I've always felt in a funny way it, it's, it, it actually adds a lot of strength to the profession, the idea that people come into this field from a variety of different routes. Um, so not so good for the individual trying to plan their way in, perhaps, but actually in in a way, you know, just, just gives a bit more variety. Um, as I'm sure we'll get onto later in the discussion, uh, conservation science can mean many, many things from a you know an individual analytical technique that someone has a huge ex expertise in to a much more kind of broader um, understanding of the issues. Um, and I think those different roles are really only fed properly if we have people coming in from different um, routes. So um, I, I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm, I mean, does Greg or Robin have anything to add to, to, to that? I think that summarizes it really well. And maybe we'll get into some of the more details about you know, the different routes in, into conservation science um, just, just, just a bit later. And in fact, the next question I know you're going to ask, at least because I've got the crib sheet here, um, it'll go into some, some, of, some of that. Is it possible for conservators to segue into conservation science? Yes. <laughs> Do you see a place um, for professionals who are in between conservation practice and conservation science? Yeah, OK. Um, uh, it is absolutely possible for conservators to segue into conservation science. I'm I'm someone that did that, and there are many many people in in the field who've who've done that. Um, I I think in most cases um, the conservator going into conservation science has had a scientific training, um, you know, at a bachelor's degree level before they go into conservation training. Perhaps not always, but I think that would be the the most obvious uh, uh, scenario. Um, and I, I think um, for conservators going through the training programs with a science background, um, conservation science is an obvious, you know, option um, for the sort of work to to, to go into. Um, the the second part of your question is um, something I get asked the whole time, and it's actually something that um, this this idea is there a place for professionals who are in between conservation practice and conservation science. Um, it's it's a place where I am and have always been, and it can sometimes be quite um, unsettling because you you feel you're not quite a proper 
scientist and quite not quite a proper conservator. You're kind of a bit of both. Um, but in fact, uh, when you start to really think about what's needed for the proper uh, collaboration between conservators and scientists, uh, the role that um, someone with my background plays actually becomes quite important. Uh, the idea of being able to kind of translate almost the kind of request from a conservator or the understanding the issues the conservator might need to have addressed through research and actually making that research um, meaningful and understandable and accessible to the conservator. Um, I'm sure most people listening to this have had some kind of frustration with that uh, inability to sometimes understand what science is doing um, or for the scientists to get frustrated that conservators don't seem to be interested in the right kind of question. So I, I, I absolutely think there's, there's a role, a place of professionals in the middle, but it, it can't obviously be the only way people come into this profession. It, it does need that full spectrum of uh, background and experience. Great. And I, I'm going to skip around on some of these questions a little bit. Um, are you seeing particular trends now that differ from those available to you when you were pursuing a career in conservation science? Is there a particular training pathway that you recommend? So I think I'm going to jump in on this one. Um, so even you know, a little over 10 years ago, uh, when I was looking um, for a graduate program, conservation science wasn't so highly publicized or and well known, I think, as it is today. Um, and I was interested in trying to do research related to conservation, and there really wasn't an easy way to to find professors. Um, I tried doing some searching, and in the end, decided that. Um, you know, going for organic chemistry um, would be a good foundation to understand some of the issues that happen um, in uh, in art materials. Um, and I think uh, as far as ways to get in, I know there are a lot of groups now, or there's a handful of groups now um, in the U.S. and in Europe where you can uh, definitely get a Ph.D. Um, with a, a relation to conservation issues and studying um, art, art materials. Um, and also there are a lot more postdoc opportunities now, um, even from six years ago when I started looking. Um, so that's nice to see that there are a couple, couple more options out there. And uh, you also definitely need a PhD for conservation science. Um, all positions after graduate school require now a PhD, um, so you definitely have to get that. Yeah, I would say I would I would second that. That certainly the amount of exposure for both conservation and conservation science is uh, much much greater than it was certainly when I was feeling my way into the career. Um, certainly with social media explosion. Uh, we just saw recently, you know, Harvard had their Forbes pigment collection just uh, seeded a little story to the local news and now it's sort of viral and everybody's hearing about these remarkable pigments and the way they're preserved and stored at places that you would have never seen that back in 1995 or so. Um, partly that's because uh, of the development of social media. Uh, also, the expansion of our field in the past decade, there are a lot more museums that have labs. There are a lot more people practicing conservation science or cultural heritage chemistry. There are far more academic programs, especially in Europe, that provide a PhD, particularly in conservation science. And there are a lot more uh, academic researchers in the United States who are collaborating with museums and doing work that is related to conservation science. So. Um, as you open up uh, uh, an issue of the Journal of Brahmin Spectroscopy, you're going to always find two or three articles that are on cultural heritage. If you look in JAC's or uh, some of the other American Chemical Society journals, you'll begin seeing, uh, whereas it may have been ever so often a cover story about scientists and museums, now you start finding their research papers as part of the, the main body of the journal. Can I just jump in here, Amelie, and say one thing about the PhD aspect uh, that Robin mentioned? Um, and this is only coming from the viewpoint of, 
of someone that now um, you know hires in people, uh, and we have a constant discussion here about whether to write a PhD being required or just expected. Um, and I, I think the reason we sometimes just err on the side of caution and say a PhD is expected or something is, is not to rule out perhaps slightly more senior figures who, who haven't felt the need to um, go through the PhD route. But I think for people coming through the system now, um, it's completely expected, um, even though you may not see required written on every single job dis description. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with the idea that, that it, it is the best route at some point to go through your PhD. And if not required, you can certainly guarantee that all of your competition for that position are going to have PhD. So. Right, exactly, exactly. Great, so how should someone choose a graduate program to prepare for a career in conservation science? Can you touch on some of the options available in North America and, and abroad? So I think I'm going to jump in on this one first, since I guess I'm the, the most recent um, person looking for a graduate program. So um, other postdocs that I've met and other conservation scientists have um, specialties in a variety of fields. So, and like Tom said in the beginning, there really isn't just one way um, or one route um, to become a conservation scientist. And there's not one PhD program um, that's really um, the specific way to go. Um, so, but I know a lot of people have, uh, you know, foundations and fundamental theories that are um, rooted in chemistry or ma materials, um, and, and some even have an optics or physics background, um, which can be helpful and um, also have gained a lot of specialized instrumentation experience along the way. Um, so, um, and now that I'm, a, I'm on the, the job seeking end of things, um, I actually recommend um, looking for a program that is not directly or completely related to conservation science so that you can be marketable for other positions in the future. Um, but I think also um, having that broader experience and, and really getting down to some of the fundamentals um, has really helped. Um, understand some conservation issues that I've come across um, beyond graduate school. Um, but I think even, you know, if you are looking for things, um, looking for uh, research groups that, you know, maybe they, they specialize in a special technique and they look at a variety of materials and, and maybe some of those materials might be art related. Um, could be a good way to go, um, but you also have to think about what you're comfortable with as far as you know the university size, the city, what what type of standards the the program has, um, and uh, the other thing is if, obviously if you're interested in conservation science, I think finding uh, a graduate program that's in a city that also has uh, museums with scientists in it or already has collaborations with the local museums um, is a good way too so that you can connect um, with those museums and, and kind of learn about the field um, but don't necessarily um, have to devote your entire time to uh, conservation in the beginning. Yeah, I'd say um, definitely one of the things that you want to focus on is choosing a graduate program that you're going to be able to get through you know, and enjoy because it's going to be four or five years of your life. and uh, as Robin was saying, there's so many uh, aspects to conservation science. The field is so broadly defined that you could pretty much land in any sort of physical or life science or applied science and uh, receive training and experiences that are going to be directly applicable to working at a museum, whether that's environmental chemistry or forensics, archaeometry, entomology, the optics, computer science, all of these different areas. Uh, certainly in my lab, uh, we have uh, a spectroscopist, a forensic scientist, a biochemist, and a cell uh, biologist. So um, you know, that's a pretty diverse range of experiences that are all brought to bear on the problems that the lab's addressing. And that's one of the strengths that I think Tom was speaking about, uh, at least on the American side, where there's never been a direct route into conservation science. You get the opportunity to bring together all of these people with a wide range of uh, training. 
In regards to chemistry PhD programs, what specialties are well suited for careers in conservation science? Well, I, I would say probably the same sort of thing. All of us come from um, different areas. You're, you've got Robin who did organic chemistry. I was a physical analytical chemist. Uh, you know, Tom's uh, probably more in analytical, uh, analytical and organic. Uh, any of those areas is going to have an application in the field. Um, and as I was mentioning, even forensic science and environmental chemistry, all of those two are going to have uh, useful experiences to bring to bear on the problems that we address in museums. And what's the best way to find principal investigators who are interested in conservation science research? That's a good question. Um, so first off, listening to seminars like this, and um, I would say um, speaking, if you can connect with people in museums that know of other um, universities in the area that they work with um, and, and trying to find out who they are that way, um, but also just looking at journal articles, whether it's in the cultural heritage field or um, even in some of the the ACS journals or um, other uh, science journals and seeing what um, what people are, are uh, submitting papers or writing papers and studying cultural heritage. Um, but you could also look at speaker lists from different cultural heritage conferences um, that you could try to get your hands on. Um, or also like the analytical conferences, whether it's PitCon or Eastern Analytical um, or you know the, the ICOM CC Scientific Research Working Group or the AIC Research and Technical Studies Group um, can give you sometimes a, a, a good starting place. And in my experience, I ended up in a, a, a program working for a PI who was a, a senior faculty member, so he wasn't under the sort of uh, duress to um, publish and drive his research program, which it, for me meant flexibility. This was a time when conservation science was not very widely known. He had never actually considered it or thought of it or heard of it, uh, but he was kind of a bon vivant and also involved in a lot of different things himself. Uh, he was a, an actor and um, obviously had also been bitten by the culture bug, and so he thought it was great. It did require fundraising on my part, so I had to seek out fellowships, which would give me the flexibility to pursue the, the things that I was interested in, in particular the archaeological field work. Uh, but you know, once those financial constraints were lifted, he was willing to go wherever the, the research took us. And at that point at Duke, there was no one who was focusing on cultural heritage. And after being in that group, he continued to work in that field after I graduated and left. And now there are several faculty members there and several postdocs coming out of Duke who have sort of you know grown up in that area of cultural heritage chemistry now. So, what type of skills should students be gaining in graduate school to better prepare them for postdoctorate and permanent positions? Well, I can um, start off on this one, um, and I depending a little bit on whether we're talking about um, science graduate school or conservation graduate school. Maybe I'll answer both because I, I kind of have um, thoughts on both of those. But essentially, if if um, if you're at a, a graduate school reading some kind of scientific uh, degree, um, really uh, it's it's the bit that you're not doing that, that that you should be doing to prepare better. So in fact, some of the things that has been mentioned all, all already by Robin, perhaps um, mostly um, this idea of just um, seeking out, you know, experience and exposure to uh, museum situations, or if, uh, if there are other type of conservation issues going on, um, it, it, it depending where on, a, on 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 where you are. Obviously, in New York, it's very very easy. If you're in the middle of nowhere, it's perhaps a little bit more difficult. But um, again, looking at this a little bit further forward from um, applying for positions and fellowships and internships, even. Um, it's, it's now getting, um, you know, 
pretty competitive in, in all those areas. So especially um, the, the internship level at the, at the Getty, for example, we have high numbers of interns applying every single year for the graduate in, intern program. And if we're seeing people who come through the science graduation courses, um, one of the things I look out for is you know how much exposure. Um, when 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 Greg said you know you have to be bitten by the bug, that that has to come through. So um, even though there is a place for um, you know pure scientists to come into the field and do some research, then move out again, it's it's far more common for someone to to enter the conservation science science field with with a desire to work in this area, um, and then perhaps the other avenue in of people at conservation um, training programs interested in um, a scientific uh, career in conservation science. It's just it's just the you know the it is just the opposite. It's it's showing um, uh, very very much in interest in different sorts of analytical techniques, being prepared to research, starting to give papers, um, just getting your your yourself known. Um, I think again, if you're looking to hire few people in, if you see someone who's been through a conservation program, um, but with a real interest in science or perhaps a, a bachelor's background in science, I'd, I'd be asking fairly specific questions about um, what techniques you were using and why were you doing that, um, and just just to show that people have actually put a bit more thought into it, other than just saying I'm interested in science. Yeah, if I think about what I would encourage someone to develop during that four or five year PhD, you know, obviously the, the broad training and the experiences, uh, developing that insatiable curiosity that is what's going to sustain you in the field, um, research and experimental design, which is what the PhD ought to be teaching you. I think one thing that we are particularly pressed to master in conservation science is the ability to write and communicate to a very diverse audience. So I uh, am often required to talk to hardcore scientists, but also to talk to uh, the museum audience. So our lab is being put out in front more and more often where we're communicating directly with the public. Uh, and so being able to, you know, regardless of what your PhD project is, if you can explain that to someone in sort of an elevator pitch, uh, you know that's a good skill to develop, uh, as well as you know time management and all those sorts of things. Because most of us have more projects than we have time and uh, staff to tackle, so being able to prioritize um, certainly is important. I'd agree with all that, and I don't really have anything to add. Great. Um, what types of research topics and instrumentation experience are good foundations for transitioning into a postdoctorate position or a permanent position? So, um, just from a job seeker point of view, um, you know, getting some experience with having, you know, F um, FTIR, maybe some, a little bit of XRF or or ramen, um, and uh, also um, some optical microscopy um, would be good uh, to help you and in, in, in questions um, in the future. Uh, but I think also, yeah. um, I was going to say one more thing, um, you know, if you can get your hands on um, learning some of the synchrotron techniques. I think that's also something that's um, becoming more and more of an interest um, in our field. And I, I was just going to sort of build on that a bit and say, um, yes, I, 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 I think those basic techniques Robin mentioned are probably the first ones to, to, to think about. Um, and it is true that there's a lot of excitement and access on synchrotrons right now. Um, but I, I kind of want to bring in something which is uh, very related to this, and it, it's the idea of luck. Um, you know, sometimes positions come up that require a real specialization, and it's just really difficult, if not impossible, to predict these sort of things. So in those situations, um, it might be someone who's had a huge amount of experience on HPLC, for example, would just win hands down, um, whereas for many positions, that kind of experience wouldn't wouldn't matter so much. So um, 
it's it's just it's just so hard to kind of you know map these things out so precisely, um, especially when um, you know the it it's it, it is true I think what everyone's saying that there are many more PhD opportunities now, especially for prepared to travel um, within the U.S. and in fact to Europe in particular, and there are you know, still a number of great postdoc fellowships. So so there's a there is a kind of a route um, that takes you through to that point. But then, then when you start to hit the the position uh, moment, it 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 typically needs someone to retire to open up a position. Um, it's it's very rare for places to be expanding their conservation science uh, staff, um, and it so it, it you just need to hit it right at the right time of, of a position op opening up and often a specialization. So it's just part of the deal, I'm afraid. And and sometimes you luck out. And other 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 times you'd be the most perfect person for a position, but it's just there isn't one there to 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 uh, to be offered. Um, and I I mean I know I'm going slight, slightly off topic here, but I I've also noticed in the U.S. in particular, um, there's a lot of musical chairs that goes on. So you know one position op op opens up and someone moves to there, and then someone else moves to that position, and it's it's quite interesting to watch how um, you know one opening can actually trigger all kinds of movements um, around around the country. And I would agree that the, the serendipity aspect of it, that if you happen to have just the right training at the right time in the right place, it can all, it can all come together. Uh, as, a, as a general rule, we say you, know, you want to be familiar with as many analytical techniques as possible. And unfortunately, PhD programs typically don't follow that sort of uh, uh, guideline. You, you're in a lab that focuses on spectroscopy, in, in my case, you know, time domain infrared spectroscopy is what we did every day. And for a lot of the other things that we needed, we had collaborators who were experts. And you heard a little bit about it, but you weren't the person who was necessarily running the experiments and operating the instrumentation. What I found incredibly useful for me, even though I was funded through a lot of my PhD, was to uh, throw my hat in the ring for teaching jobs, uh, in particular the PA positions for all the advanced analytical labs. So that even though it wasn't using it in sort of a research focus, you get very familiar with all of the different analytical techniques because you have to teach them to undergraduates and you have to make sure that they're working for the lab courses. So in doing that, you know, that spectroscopy focus that was my PhD developed into familiarity with GC and mass spec and electro electrochemistry and thermal analysis and all these other things that I could then kind of build myself as having at least an introductory knowledge, a working knowledge of this particular analytical technique. Yeah, actually, can I just respond back to that? Because it's really interesting what you said, Greg. And I um, just, again, perhaps we're getting slightly off topic of the question, but it's just triggering some of the thoughts that it's, I found it sometimes quite hard to predict, um, you know, who, if someone has a specialization in a technique and you want to train them on another technique, some people just pick up every technique under the sun without any problems whatsoever, and other people really struggle. And it's 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 often quite difficult to predict that. Um, so it's 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 you know that's something that again, if if you are able just in your natural blood to pick up new techniques effortlessly and just um, start to you know create great results very quickly, that that's a wonderful asset to have. Um, Especially because then, if you have gone through the so the sort of typical PhD route as Greg was describing of specialization, specializing, sorry, in a in a topic or a, or a technique that you're able to demonstrate um, a great ability to to jump, you know, across uh, in, instrumentation. Um, but but some, you know, to be honest, some people struggle with 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 with, with that. And I mean, I've, uh, the places I've worked, the Tate and now the GCI. Um, I've seen examples of, of, of that the, the, the whole time. It, it could be interns coming through, it could be uh, PhD candidates, it could be permanent positions. Um, if, 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 if you're someone that can do that and can you know, get comfortable perhaps with switching a technique very, very quickly and have a rapid learning curve, um, then you're, you're a very attractive you know, person to someone want, wanting to hire in. When applying for postdoctorate fellowships in conservation science, is it necessary to already have experience working with cultural property or artist materials? Well, I think 
uh, you know, unless you did your PhD in one of these groups that focuses on cultural heritage, everyone has to start somewhere. So, um, you know, for me, that was in the archaeological field work where I started to get used to being around cultural heritage objects, and then more in my my postdoc afterwards. Um, you know, certainly in my particular situation here at the IMA, uh, we draw on students from the local universities, none of which are actually pursuing cultural heritage in those academic settings. And so we get a lot of people whose first experience were working, you know, maybe they were interested in art or painting um, in their high school years, but their, their first opportunity to work directly with an artwork uh, performing analyses is, is here in the lab. So it's not absolutely necessary, but I would encourage everyone to try and seek out those experiences as early as they can. Even if your PhD topic is more mainstream, there are opportunities to volunteer in museums, to take courses outside of your uh, PhD area, uh, to volunteer to be a part of an excavation or, or whatever, just to start building that resume of uh, experiences you've had working with art and understanding art. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say uh, in general um, it, it really helps um, if there's been some exposure or experience with working in some capacity with cultural property um, or artist materials. It's, um, it's definitely not uh, a requirement, um, and I think, in fact, if I, I remember when the um, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, postdocs were being set up, that was explicitly stated that these are intended or targeted at people who have very little exposure or, or, or already with cultural property to, to bring them into the field, um, have them get bitten by the bug, and then remain in the field to advance the profession. Um, but I think. Um, in many cases, um, certainly when we have people applying to our postdoc position at the GCI here, we've had a range of backgrounds, and um, some, if not, well, most of them would have had some significant ex interest or, or demonstrated um, experience with working in this area. Um, it, it, to me, it, it's it, it would be un, it's quite un, unusual, but not impossible for someone to go through a PhD and all the way through to a, to a postdoc position without some kind of um, interest or uh, exposure to this, uh, to, to conservation science. And I just want to add that I have met some um, fellows that have come straight from grad school without, with very little experience, um, maybe some interest, but very little experience. Um, and a lot of times it was for specific um, positions and they had the right kind of skills. Um, so again, it's that, that luck, the, the matching of, of what you have and what's needed uh, for the fellowship. Thanks. Robin, what does the job market in conservation science look like after completing graduate study? What's the typical next move? Um, so the typical next move is definitely a postdoc fellowship, um, and I think preferably in a museum. Um, and for, I'd say, all the positions I've looked at, um, they generally require at least three years of museum experience, um, and most of them are counting that after grad school. Um, so that can, you know, you definitely want to to build up your postdoctoral um, fellowship experience um, for if you really want to stay in the field. Um, but with that said, you know, I'm, I'm here going on almost five years, um, so the, the job openings are, you know, kind of slim, and you, you definitely have to think, um, you know, is this something I really want to do, do I want to stay in it, and, and think about other options, other ways to still work with cultural heritage, um, potentially, you know, being a, a professor, um, you know, starting your own research group and and having some of your research be related um, to cultural heritage and being able to work with museums. Um, so that's something uh, you should think about. But, you know, I think there's been a lot more openings lately than there have been in the past. You know, I 
keep my eye out on the, the conservation disk list. Um, I started looking at that when I was back in um, grad school just to get an idea of what kind of things are opening um, and, and where they're opening. Um, so, yeah, so definitely the first step is, is, is fellowships. And with the limited number of jobs and the increased interest in the field, do you foresee any expansion of jobs in the field? I don't know that we're going to see the same sort of flourishing of new labs like happened maybe a decade ago. Um, the, the Mellon Foundation helped uh, start a number of labs at uh, museums across the country. And, you know, that, that could happen, but um, but failing that, I, I think probably the area where we're going to see a lot more expansion is in academia, and in particular as um, different research groups start to learn about how the interface of art and sci science allows opportunities for them to explore their topic of interest. Um, I think you're going to start seeing more and more faculty members at the undergraduate level starting to incorporate chemistry of art and conservation science into their courses and, of course, as, as, a, as a means of teaching chemistry and attracting people who might not have otherwise responded to just a straightforward mainstream chemistry course. So I think that uh, one area where we might see additional opportunities is in faculty positions, uh, whether they be research or teaching. Yeah, just to um, jump on that, um, I, I, I think that's exactly right, Greg, and um, it, it does actually you know, offer some excitement and some optimism to this um, feel which otherwise it, it just feels so um, th th you know this is this is the crunch point this is the moving from all the training the postdoc the fellowships which um, you know it, there aren't masses but there there are enough out out there um, to, to to move into a position is is the difficult part and I I I think what's um, very nice about our profession is that um, you know there's an amazing network so Robin mentioned the conservation disk list. Um, but any position in a, for a conservation scientist in a museum or an institution, you'll, if, if you're assigned to the right places, you'll immediately get four notifications or I don't know, three or four of the same position. So the, the scientific research working group of Icon CC, for example, um, they'll, the, all these things will get circulated. So it isn't as if people won't um, hear about opportunities. Um, and the, the other, again, this is not maybe not particular on, on topic, but it just a thought struck my mind that, you know, going back to the very beginning when you asked about the differences in roles and trainings of conservation scientists to conservators, um, in, in the conservation profession, of course, the vast majority of people now go in, into private practice. It's just that there's still a massive profession out there for conservators to move, move, move into if positions don't open up in, in museums. Um, in conservation science, it's very, very different. Um, that there, there are one or two very, very good, you know, private practices for conservation science, but uh, it's still, um, it's very, very difficult, of course, if you get to this point and decide to set up your own laboratory. It's, it's ridiculously expensive, and um, it's, it's, I don't think I've ever heard of someone do that at that point. It tends to be much more established people who, who get to, to move into private practice. Usually with some sort of agreements or associations with other institutions, it's yeah, like because yeah. you know who's going to be able to afford a XRD or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, quite, quite, and, and actually, um, it it should just be really stressed the extraordinary um, uh, thing that the Mellon Foundation did to establish all those positions in in the major you know institutions, the museums in in the U.S. mainly, some some outside, but mainly the U.S. So. You know, museums that never had a conservation science department have have endowed positions, and indeed some of the sort of mid-scale have a second position. Um, and it's it was extraordinary to see those positions in endowed and so you know pro protected. Um, but at the moment, there isn't a sign that another you know massive amount of funding will come to establish um, an, an, an an expansion in the in the in the field. 
and that was not just at museums, but the Mellon Foundation also sponsored second science positions and all of the conservation training programs. Again, you know, you had three or four new jobs created in that uh, effort as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What are museums looking for in applicants for conservation science positions? Well, I, I see my name's down for this first, even though I don't actually work for a, a museum, strictly speaking. Uh, the Getty Conservation Institute is, is, is related to the Getty Museum, of course, with sister or, or organizations, and we work very closely with the conservators. But um, it's, it's just um, <laughs> very hard to answer this question for the reasons we've described a bit earlier, that um, it, there are so many different types of position that we would be looking for. Um, ranging from you know a, a fairly broad experience with different te techniques to answer typical questions coming out of a, a conservation or a curatorial questions from a, mu um, a museum but we also get involved with very specific projects on particular types of research or particular types of art ob object um, just one example we're currently running a project looking at the conservation of animation cells so when we look for someone to, to um, you know work on a project, we found just one person who had a significant amount of experience working on animation cells, um, and that's perhaps not surprising, but that's, um, there are also times where, where we're hiring people where we want that sort of very broad um, background. Um, but I, I, I expect, um, Greg, you'll have a very different output on, on this given the, the size of your department and the fact you do work for a museum. Yeah, I think, you know, if I was looking for character traits, uh, some of the things that have already been mentioned, the, the sort of insatiable curiosity that's necessary when you never know what's going to, you know, land on the desk in front of you, whether it's going to be a Dutch old master painting or a Sudanese sword that you have to um, get up to speed on, understand, you know, how it was made and what are the questions to be asked, uh, dedication for a field that, maybe isn't as lucrative as what you might get in industry or pharmaceutical labs. Uh, you have to have been bitten by the bug and really be excited about cultural heritage and fascinated with it. Um, this ability to communicate to uh, both scientists and artists and art historians and uh, oftentimes to the public who isn't always uh, sort of at the same level of science literacy as you might hope. Um, I would be looking for people that were creative and full of ideas and very resourceful because, again, trying to do big time science in a cultural institution, uh, you have this clash of the resources needed versus the, the finances that are available. Um, we're finding more and more the, this sort of new role for the science lab in proposing and curating exhibitions. So uh, bringing the science and technology that normally happens behind the scenes out into the galleries as the focus of, of the museum. And, and so all of those traits that would be necessary to engender those ideas and then uh, to see them in the offing. So um, it's, it really is not uh, a single skill set, but a lot of different skill sets, uh, some that we've traditionally associated with the sciences and a lot that we've traditionally associated with the arts. We're really working at the interface of those two. All right, and we're running a little over time, but I'd like to squeeze in one more question. Do any of you or have any of you offered training and research opportunities for undergraduate students? We definitely have here in the five years that the lab's been operating. We've had uh, 26 positions uh, from sabbatical leave faculty members, postdocs, graduate students, graduate, undergraduate, even some high school interns. Um, so we have sort of seen our, one of our areas uh, to focus on is in um, training of people and sort of proselytizing the whole conservation science uh, field. So uh, we definitely try to make those available. And usually in the summer, there we'll have at a minimum two undergraduate research fellows uh, at the IMA. And uh, just to add a couple other places that I've seen, um, I 
you know the the Met um, has done some partnerships, uh, Library of Congress, and uh, the Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute um, usually hosts a, a, a handful of summer internships. Um, and then as a undergraduate university, um, I know William and Mary has a couple of uh, professors in the chemistry department that um, have students in the summer. Yeah, and I'll, let me just finish up here. We, we, the GCI does not have a, an official program um, for this, and we certainly don't um, go looking for undergraduate um, opportunities, but we, we absolutely have um, taken people, um, typically from local universities, uh, who have just heard about conservation science, and they, they would just get in touch with us. and. Um, whether or not we take them just depends on so many things. Uh, typically, you know, there should be a, a project that they're working on. It's very rare that we would just bring someone in just to be a, um, a, a, a cheap, if not free, set of hands. Um, but and there has to be, you know, proper supervising. And um, but it, 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 it's when we've taken people, it's actually worked pretty well. Um, so there are definitely opportunities. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you Tom, Greg, and Robin for participating in our webinar today. Um, there's also a number of people that helped ECPN put this webinar together and I have their names here on a thank you slide. Um, their advice was extremely helpful. Um, so, so thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.